Good evening, everyone. My name is Bobby Saperstein, and as Director of Programming and Strategy for the Jewish Democratic Council of America, JDCA, I want to thank each of you for joining our phone and text banks this last uh, election cycle and for being with us tonight as we bring it home during our last call, 72 Hours to Save Democracy. Tonight, we are joined by Second Gentleman Doug Emhoff, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, actors Josh Gad and Beanie Feldstein, and Bill Kristol, former Republican and former Chief of Staff to Vice President Dan Quayle. Following the hour-long program, we will lead a phone and text bank training along with the phone and text banks themselves. And we encourage you to stick around and join us. For those who are anxious to start this work right away, thank you so much for your enthusiasm. We're posting the phone bank links in the chat right now, and you can get started. With that, I'm delighted to welcome JDCA CEO Haley Soifer to kickstart tonight's event. Haley? Thank you, Bobby, and thanks to everyone for joining us for our final 24 hours of phone and text banking. We could not be more proud of the work that we have all accomplished together, which includes engaging more than 1.4 million voters in support of Democrats who share our values. This is more than double the number of voters that we made that where we made contacts in 2020, and that number will continue to grow between now and when the polls close tomorrow. None of this would have been possible without JDCA supporters and volunteers, so thanks to all of you. I'm also pleased to report that our JDCA PAC ads, which support 42 Democratic candidates across 11 states, have now been seen more than 42 million times. There will be much more to talk about in the days and weeks ahead, but tonight we want to convey how grateful we are to each of you for being a part of our Jewish Dems movement. We're almost there, and we're glad you're spending the final 24 hours with us. Tonight, our first guest is none other than former Republican and former Chief of Staff to Vice President Dan Quayle, Bill Crystal. You may recognize Bill from our recent ad with Billy Crystal, and we're grateful for his continued partnership. Bill has a unique understanding of the crisis Republican extremism has caused in our political climate as a former Republican himself. He's a frequent commentator on several news networks, including CNN, and he was also the founder and editor-of-large at the political magazine, The Weekly Standard, and is now the editor-at-large of the center-right publication, The Bulwark. Bill, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Haley. Good to be with you all. Yes, and we want to thank you again for recently uh, joining us for our second ad featuring you and Billy Crystal. What started- I, I hope I hope all the people on here aren't disappointed that it's not the real Billy Crystal as people as they say. So I went oh, to 25 yeah. years, 20 years ago when Billy Crystal was super famous, you know, hosting the <laughs> Emmys every year and, and the Oscars and, uh, you know, Harry Met Sally and all that. I once had a reservation. I was giving a speech somewhere at a kind of a out of slightly out of the way holiday inn something and I got there late it was a late flight you know 11 p.m I showed up at the at the motel and said hi I'm here to check in my name uh I'm Bill Crystal and this very nice 18 to 18 year old I'd say desk clerk looked up and said oh you're not Billy Crystal and I <laughs> said well I'm Bill Crystal it's like you know and she was so disappointed I mean she had like been waiting all evening for Billy Crystal to check into this motel near some college town in I don't know Ohio or something where I was giving this uh, a talk the next morning and so I feel I've always felt ever since then that I I'm like a walking disappointment to certain people by by not being the real Billy Crystal you know because she said you're not the real Billy Crystal so Sorry. For us, it was anything but, and it was <laughs> the idea of JDCA's uh, board member, Susan Wagner, to bring the two bills for Biden together in 2020, and we were so glad that you reunited as two bills for Dems in 2022, so oh, thank you. Happy to do it. Um, so, Bill, I want to ask you a few things uh, and you are have been prolific on Twitter. And so I'm going to ask you a few things from the past few days that you about what you've said on Twitter. So recently today, uh, we all saw Elon Musk uh, had advice for independent voters. He advised that Repu they support Republicans for Congress because Democrats already have the White House. 
And you responded with your own words of wisdom for independent voters. You said a commitment to truth, decency, and rule of law curbs the worst excesses of partisan zealotry and demagoguery. Therefore, I generally recommend voting for Democrats, given that today's GOP is not committed to truth, decency, and the rule of law. Well, thank you for that, Bill. Um, independent voters are likely going to decide the outcome of many close elections tomorrow night. What message do you think resonates most with independents? And do you think a majority of them see things like you do or like Elon does? I mean, obviously, different messages resonate in different states, different candidates, you know, and, and, and also different independent voters. So uh, there's no one size fits all. But I do think to the degree that, uh, you know, sort of pro-Republican types have managed to sell the notion, which is what Elon Musk really said, of, you know, this is just a normal election. And if you're a little uncomfortable with Democrats running everything, why not put the Republicans in charge of what are both branches? And they can't really do that much damage. President Biden is still president. I mean, it's kind of the standard off. This is why mid-year elections do tend to go against the party in power and why it's not totally irrational of voters in either party to sort of figure, well, let's just check the other, the other party. And I would myself not be as worked up, I guess, about that prospect if it were a, quote, normal Republican party, that it would be, you know, 1995 again or something, and uh, you could have a decent performance by the country over the next several years. But when you're electing election deniers, especially obviously for governor and secretary of state, but in, as senators in key states, even as House members, if the whole party is becoming uh, sort of the defenders of uh, almost violence, I guess let's call it violence adjacent to politics, demagoguery, nativism, and so forth, uh, it's it's that's a different it's a different world, and I think that's Elon Musk. I think knowingly is pretending it's not a different world, and uh, others, uh, but but more of the mainstream media types and commentators have sort of fallen into that trap a little bit too. So that's why I thought it was worth reminding people that, you know, people can make individual decisions. And if in their own congressional district, they're okay with some Democrat Republican, I guess it's okay. But even there, if that Republican's voting for Kevin McCarthy for speaker, then you're ensuring that Marjorie Taylor Greene is running and uh, helping to run an investigation led by Jim Jordan. I mean, people, this is why Liz Cheney, to her great credit, once she broke after Jan January 6th, uh, said, look, I also can't support McCarthy for speaker, and I can't really recommend voting for Republicans, she basically has said across the board. She's only, she's endorsed a few Democrats explicitly, but so I think it's very important that people think more broadly about the kind of Republican Party we are, they might be putting in charge of either House of Congress, not just about the individual vote, maybe it's someone they voted for before, and, you know, the incumbent's not so offensive and did a good job helping get some bridge built, you know, there are such Republicans in Congress still, but the overall effect of a Republican House, but especially a Republican Senate, and certainly of these Republican governors, would be very dangerous. So you also recently tweeted, uh, hey, don't want to interrupt my Democratic mm. friends when they're engaged in their favorite sport of gnashing of teeth and tearing of garments. But it looks as if the Democratic Party will have the best midterm performance by a party in the White House in two decades. So, Bill, we love the positive outlook, and we can confirm the teeth gnashing, and not sure about the tearing of garments among Dems, but tell us more about why Democrats should be preparing for a good night relative to historical precedent for the party in power. I mean, it's been striking throughout this whole election season how much the conventional wisdom has been. Well, historically, there's often been a wave recently against the incumbent party. And therefore, there's going to be one this year. And I remember six months ago, I was skeptical. The data showed at that point before Dobbs that Republicans were likely plus two, plus three in the generic ballot, but that's not plus eight, which is what a wave is. And it looked like there might be, you know, erosion of Democratic seats in the House and the Senate and so forth. Then Dobbs came down, the, the economy, the gas prices began to, get, began to come down by demonstration of some legislative achievements. The extreme character of some of the Republican nominees became more obvious as they won primary after primary in Massachusetts and Ohio and Arizona and other states. Uh, and the Democrats had a pretty big and unprecedented rally, really, over the summer for the in party. Probably moved up a little bit by September, mid September. Then there was a little bit of a counter rally, as was to be expected, which is incidentally stalled out if you just look at the polls. Uh, but the Democrats being Democrats, or, you know, looking at the glass half empty, not the glass half full. It's an even playing field. I mean, the last four of the last five uh, 
nonpartisan polls have shown literally 48, 48, 48, 47, 48, 49, depending on your likely voter screen. I mean, incredibly even field. And many of the states have very, very close rate, basically margin of error races for Senate, for governor. And many of the congressional districts, Virginia, where I live, Abigail Spanberger and Elaine Lurie are both in uh, totally toss up races. So the thing you do in a toss up race is you work as hard as you can. And 500 votes could make a difference in some of these races, 1,000 votes. Uh, and you uh, and and you work as hard as you can, but but that's just a fact. I mean, that's what this, we're not in a wave, you know, we're in an even playing field, which will be slugged out. A lot will depend on the individual candidates. That's one reason I've spent a lot of time, the group I'm involved with, uh, the Republican Accountability Project, spent so much time highlighting what Carrie Lake has said, what Mastriato has said, what others have said, because you really need to get those swing voters who are remaining to kind of say, oof, that's just a bridge too far. So anyway, I don't think people should be complacent. I mean, it could when you've got so many races that are this close, they could topple one way or the other. That sometimes happens. Or they could just split and some could go well from our point of view and some some not so well, but I'm reasonably optimistic, actually. I, I, if I had to bet right now, I would bet Democrats hold the Senate and maybe pick up a Senate seat or two. House is tough to hold just because of the dynamics of the year and some of the redistricting stuff. Though I don't think it's out of the question to hold the House, but certainly to make it close enough to make it hard for McCarthy to do, cause too much trouble, I would say, but maybe they could hold it. And then some of these key governorships, of course, which I know you're, you're involved in as well. We like the positive outlook, Bill. Thank you. Um, in closing, you know, we we tie our work to our Jewish values. And as a Jew and as a former Republican, why is speaking out as as you have really dedicated yourself to uh, speaking out against your former party so important to you in this moment? Well, because that party really is not not everyone in the party by any means is bigoted, of course, and some of them privately don't like it, and a few of them publicly say distance themselves a little. But at the end of the day, let's just take the most obvious example as Jewish uh, Americans that that strikes us. I think Doug Mastriano is the Republican nominee for governor of Pennsylvania, a very important job in a very important state. He happens to be running against the Jewish uh, against uh, uh, Josh Shapiro, who's Jewish. Uh, and Mastriano has flirted, or really more than flirted, let's be honest, with anti-Semitism and with bigotry of all kinds. And most of the other Republicans, some of the other Republican candidates don't sound like Mastriano, though some do. Carrie Lake's pretty close. But they're all supporting him. They're all supporting Carrie Lake. This is where the party has, the, the degree to which the party establishment and the people who allegedly privately say, oh, I don't really like that stuff, they are going along. They're not objecting. And in many ways, doing more than going along, they're campaigning for these people. So young kid in my state who presents himself as more respectable is out campaigning for Carrie Lake and I believe for Mastriano as well uh, and Herschel Walker as well and so forth so uh, they're not and Kevin McCarthy announces the Republican agenda for the House with Marjorie Taylor Greene standing right behind and I, I think that's unacceptable and that the party as a whole needs to be repudiated as much as possible and um, it's not just a few bad apples, so to speak, and that always happens. Each party has some extremists and you just kind of assume that we kept it at, at the edges, but that's not the case with the Republican Party. The parties are a totally different situation. On Ukraine, an issue I care a lot about, I know you do, Haley, um, I imagine most people do. 30 progressive Democrats, foolishly, in my opinion, signed this letter, which is a little bit confusing and they, maybe they sort of mistaken it a little bit when they signed it or whatever. Anyway, foolish letters seem to indicate a backing off from support for Ukraine. Pelosi denounced it. They worked behind the scenes. Others said no. Biden administration said no. They worked behind the scenes and they withdrew the letter. I've rarely seen that actually in Washington within about 36 hours. On the Republican side, after saying they were sound on Ukraine, they've gradually been caving in to Marjorie Taylor Greene and to Trump. And, and they've now polluted the Republican electorate, like half of them are sort of anti-Ukraine. And I think it'll be okay in terms of the, some Republicans will hang tough, but look at the difference in the two parties there. Marjorie Taylor Greene has been the leading edge of where the Republicans are going. The, Democrat, the Democrats who I think there are some who are foolish and uh, on, on the fringe of the Democratic party have been mostly repudiated and certainly aren't the leading edge of anything. And final point, I've gone on too long. I mean, the Democrats have a lot of We've focused on the Republican extremists, understandably. Democrats have a lot of good candidates this cycle, actually, I would say, that don't get enough credit, you know, for being good candidates. The Democratic candidates for governor 
in the big states, a lot of the Senate candidates are actually impressive. And, and a lot of the House candidates like Spanberger and Luria here in Virginia are really, oh, that's re-election, but are really good and promising younger, moderate, liberal, moderate Democrats, uh, pro-Israel, almost entire, almost all of them uh, in a good way. So, I mean, I feel like it's, it's Democrats haven't quite got, there's an awful lot of both sides. I mean, both sides have problems, both sides have extremists, both sides have issues, but it's not at all comparable between the two parties. And I think it's important for us and as Jews, for us to, to see that right now, the Democrats are by far the healthier party for the country and therefore for us. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you for joining us, uh, not just tonight, but doing the uh, the ad again for us with Billy Crystal. We look forward to the third iteration, maybe in 2024. We'll just keep this going every election. Cycle. That would be good. Well, my pleasure. And good luck to you all. And good luck making the phone calls and everything. So yeah. thanks so much, Bill. Great. See you. I'd now like to welcome our next guest, actors Josh Gad and Beanie Feldstein. Josh Gad is an accomplished actor and producer. You may recognize him from his role as Elder Cunningham in The Book of Mormon, the beloved voice of Olaf in Frozen, or most recently as Lafoe in Beauty in the Beats. Josh is the recipient of two Annie Awards, a Grammy Award, and a Tony Award, or Tony nomination for Best Actor in a Musical. And he's also taken a firm stance against Republican extremism especially focused on gun control. He's consistently stood up against Republican leaders that refuse to pass stricter gun safety laws following the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And he's continued this advocacy into through, throughout the midterm elections using his influence and his voice uh, for this cause. And we're grateful. Amy Feldstein is also an accomplished actor who most recently starred as Fanny Bryce in the first revival of Funny Girl on Broadway and as Monica Lewinsky in Ryan Murphy's American Crime Story Impeachment. Beanie has had roles in Hello, Dolly, Lady Bird, and Booksmart, fantastic movie, which earned her a nomination for Best Actress at the Golden Globes. In addition to her, uh, her acting, Beanie is also a voice for uh, advocacy and issues related to female equality in the entertainment industry and has been politically active, including with JDCA in the Georgia runoffs in 2020 and 2021. So thank you both for joining us today. I'm gonna to start off by asking you what issues are most important to you as we head into this midterm election tomorrow? And how do your Jewish values inform your activism? So Josh, we'll start with you, followed by Beanie. Um, well, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, Beanie uh, is uh, somebody I'm obsessed with, so I'm honored to be in uh, in any of the same windows as her. And, and all of you guys, I, I cannot thank you for your advocacy and your incredible work uh, leading up to. And, and I keep using this term, and it, and it never seems to... Uh, go out of style, especially over the last 10 years, but the most consequential election of my lifetime. And I wish I didn't have to say that. So you've asked me, what is the thing that I'm um, thinking about the most right now as we enter tomorrow uh, into this midterm election? And the thing that I'm thinking about the most is, is this going to be the last free and fair election of um, my life? Uh, and I and I, I I wish I didn't feel this nagging sense of of dread if we don't get the results that we really need to get. But as Bill Crystal just said so beautifully and profoundly, uh, we are in a pivotal period right now where people like Marjorie Taylor Greene are not the exception but becoming the norm. And if enough election deniers get put in positions of power. Um, not only in, in federal office, but also in state elections, we're going to have a lot of problems. Um, and I also, maybe it's a fact that I play Olaf, but I, I, I'm forever an optimist. And I'm optimistic about tomorrow. Um, I, I think pollsters generally have proven themselves to be not very good at their one job. And I have a sense that if anybody's going to show some surprises tomorrow. Um, it's going to be indicative of, of the last couple of elections where the pollsters have been wrong. And in this case, it's going to favor the Democrats. Just because I'm seeing a lot of incredible 
um, outpouring from people who are like-minded uh, and they're all showing up. And it's imperative that we keep pushing up until the very last minutes. Um, but it, it's everything. It, it's it's women's right and, and access to uh, make decisions for their own bodies. It's um, it's the, the things I don't even have an imagine, imagination strong enough to um, to put into motion what could be taken away that is still a right that we all hold dear to us. Um, and it's also uh, this idea of fascism uh, becoming, you know, seemingly um, transparent now uh, by, by people who are running things like Twitter. Um, and, and that scares me to death because I'm the grandson of Holocaust survivors. And, you know, the, the, the warning that we all vowed to keep in mind moving forward was to never forget. And, and that can't just be an expression that, um, that we share occasionally with others uh, in times of desperation. It's got to be something that we all hold dearly every day before we get to that point of no return. And I fear um, the proximity uh, to anti-Semitism uh, in, in, you know, in the, the circles of influence like the NBA and others that are, are um, seemingly becoming more and more um, okay by the day. And that it's, it's these things that are becoming normalized by people like Donald Trump who have clearly shown that once you open Pandora's box, it's, it's very hard to, to put it back. So that's what's driving me. Uh, that's why I'm on this call. I, I am eager to fight these fuckers to my last breath. And that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, and we're going to win because we have no choice, right? Uh, we have no choice whatsoever. So let's beat these bastards back and show the world that they do not deserve to ever even be within inches of power again. Appreciate the candor. Beanie. Oh, God. oh my God. I came dressed as my idol Olaf today. Um, <laughs> the feeling is oh, so cool. Um, but uh, I'm wearing actually a necklace that my mom got me five, almost five years ago that says 1973. And um, it was made uh, in um, celebration of Bro versus Wade. And at the time, it was the money went in part to Planned Parenthood and that felt beautiful and necessary, but it didn't feel under attack in the way that it does now. Um, and I actually spent uh, most of my fall in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I really don't like to fly. So I drove from New York to Pittsburgh, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So I have spent my whole, the past like three months driving through Penn, the state of Pennsylvania, one of the most in, important states um, in this election and usually every election, as we all know. And um, and also living in Pittsburgh, I was, you know, when you're on YouTube or you're watching like, I'm watching like my dog videos, um, you're targeted with ads and when your your phone knows where you are. And I started getting all of these Doug Mastriano ads. And it was truly one of the most horrifying um, obviously I live day to day in New York and I grew up in Los Angeles. So I, I never been fed these specific type of, um, I don't think any of us have been in a world where this level of extremism is just blatant. And, um, my phone would start on one of these horrific ads, or I'd be driving through on the Pennsylvania Turnpike and you would just see Trump's name, like, uh, engraved into the ground and grass, like these huge shrines. And it, it is, um, a never ending reminder of, where we are in our country right now. And so for me, um, as Josh already said, the right for a woman or whoever needs an abortion, no matter what gender they are, to get the care that they deserve and to have the right to their own body. Um, for me, I'm uh, married to a woman. So the fact that I want to feel comfortable and safe in the country that I brought her to because she's literally British. I forced her to come over here. And now I'm worried that we won't be safe here. Um, the fact that uh, 
all the trans people in our lives, all these beautiful trans people are having to fight for their right to healthcare. Um, there's so many horrific and scary issues that are, as we all know, that's why we're all here. And thank you all so much for the continued work that you do um, and showing up tonight. And I mean, we all know what the hell is going on and it's just so, so important. Well, thank you both. Uh, could you speak a bit to how your Jewish values inform this work and this advocacy that you both have done, which is so important in these midterm elections? Feeny, we'll start with you. Sure. I mean, I think that um, the two things I think of immediately when I think of my own Jewish upbringing are community and analysis. I think that as Jews, we are asked to interrogate and to never um, accept what we are given in this case, you know, in our case, the Torah, as um, we're always asked to interrogate it and keep searching and keep uh, and uh, keep having an analytical eye on this text that we've been given and and never to settle. And I think that that is where we all are and that we we cannot, ex I mean, obviously it's a completely different situation, but to always keep pushing for more answers and for more safety and for more safety within our community. And obviously we are under attack right now. And so I think that this time feels urgent and imperative that we all come together as a community as we're doing tonight um, to keep everyone we love, no matter what their religion, safe and also to continue asking questions and to continue um, searching for answers and, and pushing back. Great. Uh, be beautifully said, Beanie, and, and I second all of that. You're, you're asking me this question actually at a very interesting time of reflection uh, on these themes. Um, this past week, I, I had the opportunity to go back and watch um, all five hours of my grandfather's show of foundation tapes. And, you know, at a time in which I feel probably like everyone on this call, like I have a target on my back put there by people with uh, far more followers than myself, uh, with seemingly very few consequences. Um, it's a question that I keep asking myself. And, the, you know, Beanie used the word community. And I think that one thing that that is very apparent to me right now is that Community has always been one of our strongest assets as a, as a people and as a faith. And that community now more than ever that has a tendency sometimes to shy away from these issues. We, we don't wanna bring more attention to ourselves, rightfully so, because there've been very dire consequences when we do. But I have made the choice to speak out and speak out loudly where I can and call these fuckers out with every ounce and fiber of my soul, because I want to go on record and say this is wrong every single time somebody thinks it's okay, whether that's Trump, Kanye, or Kyrie Irving. Whoever it is, I don't care if it's a Democrat or Republican, it's not okay. Hate speech is not okay, no matter who you are. And to me, again, I have been really emboldened and felt great safety in numbers. And whether it's people like all of you or whether it's, you know, fellow comrades like um, Amy Schumer or Sarah Silverman or people with voices who are also Jewish, that gives me hope that we're not gonna silently sit by and allow people to say these things that have very real world consequences. I don't need to see another attack on a synagogue. I don't need to see another attack on an individual walking down the street with a yarmulke. And I m have made a vow to protect all of you in the hopes that you will in turn protect me. That's our strength. Our strength is in numbers. And we've always persevered and we'll persevere through this as well. And again, you call out fascism where you see it, you call out hate where you see it, you call out anti-Semitism where you see it. And the more you call it out, the less likely it is to become uh, so prevalent that we can't stop it. Josh, something that's really stuck with me is you mentioned your optimism 
and tied it to the fact that you played Olaf and I keep thinking about uh, the, the summer song. Um, but in closing, what, what gives you hope? Uh, because you, you, you do seem um, to have this hope as we look to the future, as we look to this election and beyond. And for both of you, um, what gives you hope? Um, I'm going to have to jump onto another one of these calls right now. So I'm, I'm okay. going to, I'm going to jump really quick and say, what gives me hope is seeing all 154 of your faces. Honestly, that's what gives me hope. Uh, I'm not alone. We're, we're, we all believe that if we keep fighting and there's something worth fighting for, there's hope. So that's what gives me hope, all of you. Uh, and I know that as long as we have that, and as long as we have this passion, no matter how dark it seems, and it's never felt darker than when Donald Trump was president of the United States, we're going to eventually find the light, uh, just as we did in 2020. Love you guys. Thank you, Josh. And Love you, Beanie. Love you too. Um, I completely agree. I think the continued, um, continued work of all of us that, are, again, it's this lack of complacency, this, uh, this refusal to get comfortable, um, it is really empowering and gives me a lot of hope. And the fact that I went to early vote, there were so many people there. And I'm sure a lot of us on this call have already voted, but I can't wait to see the numbers tomorrow. And I, and I believe that with the world that we are currently in, you, we're all ready to stand up and fight, even in some ways more than when Trump was president, because it's just, it's continuing no matter what you know, and so there's like this inability to stay silent and just and to relax. And I think that is empowering and it's motivating and that turns to hope. And thank you all so much again. It's it's a real pleasure to be here and thank you for all the work you've been doing. Thank you, Beanie. We're really grateful for your partnership, for your voice and for your leadership. We will now uh, welcome our next very special guest. And to do so, I'd like to invite JDCA board member and programming chair, Susie Stern. Susie. Susie, we're just gonna have you unmute. Okay. There we go. What? Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I have to say how inspired I just was listening to uh, Josh and Dini because that's the next generation and uh, there's a lot to look forward to. Um, I am very honored to be able to introduce the second gentleman of the United States, Douglas Emma, who works along with Vice President Harris and the entire Biden administration to help Americans across the country to deliver on the goals of the Biden administration. Doug's been a lawyer for over 30 years and is especially passionate about ensuring our legal system that it, is, that it is just and equal and is an advocate of the administration's commitment to expanding federal legal resources to those in need. He also works to expand awareness in a number of the priorities of the administration, including public health, racial equity, gender equality, and education. As the first Jewish spouse of an American president or vice president, Doug has made a wonderful effort, I have to say, to share his Jewish tradition with the country, hanging a mezuzah on the front door of the vice president's residence, hosting a Passover Seder, and lighting the menorah at the White House where I was privileged to join him. Most of all, Doug is tirelessly working every day to strengthen the administration's work, protecting religious freedom. And we are very proud to call him a partner and friend. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Susie, and thank for all. Thank you for all that you do. You're everywhere, and for folks who don't know her, every place I, I, I'm at, there's Susie. Uh, she's not doing this for for acclaim or fame. She's doing it for us, and uh, she's always there for us. So thank you so much, Susie. Hallie, I see you there too. Hi, and hi, Jewish Dems. It's an honor to be here. It's uh, one day from the election. I don't know if you can see that. I just voted here in my hometown of Los Angeles. I've been traveling all across the country over the past few weeks. I've been everywhere. And I found a, a Jewish deli in Des Moines, Iowa, two days ago. And it was incredible. I had a great conversation uh, with the rabbi 
about a lot of issues, including anti-Semitism and this epidemic of hate that we are facing. And this is something uh, we all need to uh, be together on. And that's what the rabbi and I were talking about, is how to bring in other groups. And being there in Des Moines uh, with such a small Jewish pop population, he said they have no choice but to have allies and to bring everyone together uh, to be together. So um, uh, I'm, I'm confident. Uh, sometimes us, us Dems fret, but I've, I've been all over the place and all I'm seeing is enthusiasm and people voting and people lining up. And we, I was just at a rally with the vice president, my wife, uh, I don't know, a thousand people in a big room <laughs> cheering and talking about our democracy, talking about our rule of law and what a stark choice this is right now between an administration that is serious, an administration that is doing the work for the American people and doing things to help all Americans, not just Dems. And you already see what they're doing on the other side. You see it in the Dobbs decision. You see it in Justice Thomas's concurring opinion. They're coming for reproductive rights, voting rights, who you can love, how we can worship. We, we've got to make a stand on this. And the best way to do it is to vote. It's to vote. We are um, 36 hours away. I want to make sure this group of leaders uses their platforms to get the message out. It's easy to do it. Iwillvote.com. It's got all the information wherever you are on where to vote, when to vote, and all that. So, Hallie, I, I know you have a few questions. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, it's great to see your smiling face. What's great. on your mind? Well, I'm really proud of the work that we've all been doing. Uh, we started in some cases back in May, but the majority of us really started this work in September and October. And in total, so far, we've made 1.4 million direct voter contacts. And we're in our last stretch here until the polls close tomorrow. Amen. So what's your what's your message to Jewish Dems as we continue to work the phones and do our text banking and phone banking to uh, push those non-voters to the polls by the end of the day tomorrow? Well, first of all, Jewish Dems, thank you for the work you're doing. And I know it's hard and I know it's it's long hours. And all, the first message is just fight through. We've got today and tomorrow and that's it. So don't wake up on Wednesday morning and thinking you could have done more. Just do more. We're, we're right at the end. Finish strong, run through the tape, do more than you think you can do and, and we'll get this done. But I wanna preach a message of optimism there is so much we can brag about and should be bragging about, including on, on the economy. Uh, remember, just remind people where they were and what it was like two years ago. When we stood up on that stage, January 20th, 2021, two weeks after a vile attack on our capital, we had food lines, we had boarded up businesses. We, we could not gather in person the way that we're gathering in person. Children who were just living in poverty, and look, look where we are now, two years later, between from the American Rescue Plan and all the successes with a equal 50-50 Senate where my wife has had to cast the deciding vote so many times on, on issues that affect and help all Americans. Now, of course, they're out there bragging and taking credit for things that they did not vote for and, and voted against. So go out there with you know your chest back chin up with optimism and confidence because we have such a great record to to run on and then what's the choice they don't have a plan for all the things that they're complaining about they don't have a plan and they've already said what they're going to do it's just going to be baseless investigations and 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 foolishness and we can't have that it's we need serious people doing the serious job of government and so Great accomplishment for all Americans, and the, the choice is stark. No plans on the other side, and they've already told us they just want to waste a bunch of time. Elaborating on that a bit, um, what, what do you see as, uh, when you talk to voters, uh, folks from the administration talk to the American people, uh, what is really at stake in this election? We heard from the president last week about the issue of democracy. That's the number one issue for Jewish voters. Uh, not every voter though. And so what do you think resonates the most with voters in terms of the issues? Well, our democracy is at stake. And I think people 
just don't want to believe it or, or don't think that's true, but it is true. The president has said it. The vice president just gave an amazing speech at UCLA uh, talking about that. I talk about it all over the country, and I just try to give examples of it. So you've got a Supreme Court that has taken something away from the American people, something that they had had for almost 50 years, and that is the right for a woman to make decisions about her own body, uh, not with the government sitting there with them. And that's what's happened on Roe v. Wade being overturned by Dobbs. And I mentioned the, the opinion, Justice Thomas and the concurring opinion has al already talked about, well, gee, we should do something about uh, same-sex marriages, contraception, and all these other things that are based on a uh, fundamental right of privacy. And how you and I have talked about the religious issue, the faith issue. Well, we know our religion allows for abortion in certain circumstances and um, other religions as well. So why should a very small group of people who believe one thing dictate that belief on the rest of us? And the polls back this up. The numbers are huge, 70 whatever percent that believe that we should have this fundamental right to, to choose. And it's a healthcare issue. It's not just about abortion. It's about a woman who might happen to be pregnant and needs emergency medical care, whether it's an ectopic pregnancy, whether it's something unrelated. And now you've got states that have put near total bans, if not total bans on the books. So you've got women dying or will die because of the consequences of this decision. So you talk about it in, in terms of what will happen and look at voting. You're seeing in the news today where uh, people who voted uh, with, with mail-in ballots are being rejected and you've got secretaries of state running who have already said that they want to uh, dictate the winners and losers other than counting the votes. So you have to explain it. So when you say democracy is in peril, that, that might sound a little too vague for some people, but you got to really explain what's happening. And do you want to live in a world like that? Do you want to live in a world where somebody's dictating what you can do with your own body, who you can love, who you can marry, how you can vote, and having elections that uh, someone else is going to determine who wins other than just counting the votes? No. And I also tell our friends in business, you may not think this is an issue for business. Well, it is. Nobody's talking about the economies of some of these countries with, with, with dictators and lack of democracy. They're, they're not. It will affect our business. It will affect our economy. So um, people need to understand that. They need to wake up. And not voting is not an option. I've heard a lot of people say, well, I'll sit this one out. I'm upset. Don't. If you sit it out, that means you're voting for the for people who are trying to take things away from you, fundamentally change how this country is, and we cannot have that. Absolutely. The way we see it, uh, participation in our democracy and in elections is a Jewish value. Um, and in closing, you know, we're so proud to, to, to have you in this administration. Uh, and if you could talk to us a bit about how your Jewish values connect to your work. Uh, we're so proud uh, to have the mezuzah on the door of your residence and for there to be a Seder for the first time in the vice president's home. Um, but how do your Jewish values relate to the work? You know, uh, just look, look over your right shoulder behind you. It's that word justice, setting. That's, that's what it is for me. That's why I became a lawyer. That's why I've, I've fought uh, for, for folks for all these years. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing in the administration. For me, it's all about justice. It's all about what's right. It's standing up against bullies and tyrants and all these things that are trying to, to beat people down. And I want to stand next to those people and be there for them. And that's what we have in our faith. And that's what I have as a lawyer. And that's what I'm bringing to the table uh, as a openly proud Jewish person living my life the same way I always lived it, but I'm living it very publicly. And I, I want everyone else to do that. And I'm going to continue to speak up and speak out whenever I see anti-Semitism or hate. And we've all got to come together on this issue. Absolutely. And we're so grateful for an administration that won't tolerate the kind of hate that we've seen um, rising um, and has spoken out against it. We're grateful for that partnership. We're grateful for your leadership. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Hallie. Thank and you thank best. you for your leadership. Hallie is amazing. She's the best. And um, thank you to the Jewish Dems for all you do. And we're doing it for everyone. We're not just doing it for us. We're doing it for everyone. And that's how we have to approach this. And let's finish strong, everyone. 36 hours. Keep doing what you're doing. We'll sleep in a couple of days. And I'll see you all on the other side. Sounds thank great. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. We are awaiting our final speaker. Let's see if we have her. I'm getting the message. <laughs> We're waiting for Senator Gillibrand. It looks like they're gonna need another minute or two. Uh, so in the meantime, I'm gonna call on our chair, Ron Klein, uh, to deliver some words of wisdom and hope from Florida. Ron. Thanks, Haley. And thanks to all of you for being on the call today and all the work that you've done over the last couple of years leading up to this election. I think we heard from uh, the Vice President, uh, First Gentleman. Uh, we heard from uh, some, some great uh, passionate believers in, in the cause. And each one of you has a story to tell about what you've been facing and talking to voters and friends and colleagues and all sorts of folks that are either believers or on the other side. And we can't believe some of the people we're talking to that we knew as always thought of as normal people that have sort of sort of bought into this cult-like belief. And this is not about Donald Trump anymore alone. This is about the Republican Party. This is what they have become. And this is what we're fighting against. This is not, you know, five million people somehow hiding somewhere. This has become, you know, people that are emboldened to challenge the institutions. But what happened on January 6th with the fact that the people of this country, half the people are willing to turn the keys, give the keys back to the people who addressed it for a day and then disappeared. And all of a sudden it was a no, no brainer. This was a coup against the United States. And that's why this election is so important. Yes, there are some very, very important issues, but the institutions and we as Jews and our DNA know what happens when things go wrong in a host country? This country has given this community more than anything we've ever had in our history. And yet, at the same time, we look at other countries around the world and second guess Latin American countries or European countries that the way they treat their people and the dictatorships that have emerged. Well, human nature is human nature. And unfortunately, we're seeing some very, very bad things in this country. And uh, Donald Trump obviously didn't start it, but he certainly has uh, amplified it and thrown gasoline on it and his uh, supporters have backed him up. So what does all that mean? It means everything that we've been doing up to this moment, everything we're gonna do in the next 24 hours to make sure every single vote comes out because some of these, some of these races are gonna be razor thin and people, some of them will be decided by 100, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 votes. That's huge uh, in terms of where things are going. And whether it's the House or the Senate, uh, every one of us is in it for the right reason. And uh, we're gonna continue to fight this fight. So I'm here just to say as chairman and on behalf of our entire board, our young leadership group, uh, our uh, all the supporters, all of you who have been so active and supportive of us, uh, you're doing it for the right reasons. We're all in this together to fight for our country and fight for what's right. So thank you. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Haley. Great, thank you so much, Ron. Our next and final guest, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, has been the Senator of New York since 2009, following a term in the House. Senator Gillibrand is a leading voice for women's rights and equality and equity, and she's the founder of Off the Sidelines, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting Democratic women running for office. We are so grateful to Senator Gillibrand for her leadership and for leading by example. So Senator, thanks for joining us today. I wanna start by asking a question. Uh, as, a, as a firm advocate and leader on women's rights and in the lead for gender equity and equality, which include reproductive and LGBTQ plus rights, what's at stake? in this election? Well, um, unfortunately, we have a Supreme Court that made a ruling called the Dobbs decision that said that women uh, do not have a right to privacy uh, to any decision-making with regard to reproductive care. 
And unfortunately, uh, red states around the country are using their right wing legislatures to deny women the right to privacy on Facebook when they're talking to their mothers about reproductive care, denying them the right to travel when a 10 year old is trying to travel out of state with their parents because she was raped, uh, or the right to receive medicine in the mail. Uh, so that right to privacy is being eviscerated um, throughout the country because of the Dobbs decision. Um, unfortunately, Clarence Thomas, in his concurrence, went one step further and said uh, that the right to privacy shouldn't exist for any of the groups of people that jurisprudence has covered over the last 50 years, including LGBTQ equality and the right to marry, including the right to access to birth control, uh, including the right to privacy in the bedroom. So this Supreme Court um, has an eye on doing more than just what was in the Dobbs decision. Uh, we also have Lindsey Graham and we have Mitch McConnell who have said, uh, if we take back the Senate, we will codify the Dobbs decision, meaning that there'll be no federal right to privacy for women during reproductive years, which is abhorrent and a huge departure from the norms that most um, women and men have lived under for their entire lives. And so uh, it's really quite extraordinary that if we don't hold the Senate at a minimum, we will not be able to your freedom regardless of where they live. Thank you, Senator. And we know that you're out doing everything you can to ensure that Democrats win. What are you hearing from voters and what gives you hope about the outcome of this election? So I spent yesterday and Saturday campaigning up and down the Hudson Valley. And uh, the good news is I think Kathy Hochul will win the governor's race. It's tighter than it should be, but her message is strong. And I didn't see many, many Lee Zeldin signs uh, in the Hudson Valley, which is good. Uh, he may well win Long Island. And he may, may well win parts of Westchester, but I don't think he can win all of upstate. And I don't think he can win New York City. So that is enough for our governor to be reelected. And so I'm hopeful that Kathy Hochul will win. Um, we also had some good signs of uh, progress in the House races. Uh, both Josh, um, Josh is Riley. Yeah, Josh Riley and Pat. Um, Ryan were ahead in their elections. The recent polling had them up by two or three. So I'm optimistic that those two races will result in a victory. Um, our Long Island delegation races are a bit closer. So I'm not sure how that's gonna go, but I think um, Zimmerman can win his house seat. And I think we have a good chance in holding um, Kathleen Rice's seat as well. So uh, again, we, we've got good candidates who have strong messages about the economy and how Democrats are passing laws that help create jobs like the infrastructure bill and passing laws like the CHIPS Act to create advanced manufacturing so we can create more, um, not only more semiconductor and um, uh, high tech jobs, but also create a greater national security and resiliency for America. Uh, and bills like the healthcare bill uh, gives more people access to Obamacare, but also um, puts uh, caps on how much prescription drug companies can charge for the medicines that our seniors need. So a cap on insulin at $35 a month and $2,000 for all prescriptions for a year for Medicare. And so those are huge successes and candidates are talking a lot about those um, and that they're trying to meet the needs of this post COVID moment where the economy is still struggling. Uh, supply chain is still an issue. Um, OPEC countries don't want to, you know, drill more, more oil <laughs> and we have a war in Ukraine. So, um, these global issues are really affecting the cost of things. And so it doesn't matter whether you live in Europe or Asia or the United States, everyone's paying more for everything because of an almost three year pandemic. And I know how important, uh, abortion access and reproductive rights are for you. Um, when you're out on the trail, are you hearing from voters about that issue? Is it still as resonant as it was uh, even a few weeks ago? Yes, um, it's definitely a huge issue for a lot of female voters. And I think that's the reason why we haven't lost across the board, because normally in a midterm election, the party, the party in power loses many, many seats and loses both houses. I think we are going to hold the Senate because those marginal voters in places like New Hampshire and Nevada 
our voting Democrat, those women, white women in the suburbs that are always our you know, challenge to get, they are decided that they are not supporting Republicans uh, because of this issue. And so even though the top polling issues may well be public safety or the cost of things, uh, the truth is, is that there's a certain percentage of voters who are with us because Dobbs was so destructive. And that is the margin of victory in those states right now. So I do think it still impacts many voters. And um, we can close on messages of public safety or the economy to get undecided voters. But there's many who are decided who have already voted for us and have already mailed in their ballots and have already early voted because they're just not going to tolerate a country where women don't have equality under the law. Absolutely. And that, that's definitely the case with Jewish voters. Abortion access and the future of democracy are the top two issues. I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing uh, every day representing our values in the Senate. Senator Gillibrand, thanks for, for your work to elect Democrats. Let's, uh, we're hopeful for tomorrow yeah. and we appreciate your leadership. Well, thank you. And thank you for the extraordinary reach and advocacy that you guys have done. Um, it's really making a difference. And I just appreciate the dedication. It really does help. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, that was the entertainment. Uh, now we will enter into the work stage of the program. Uh, we're going to begin our phone banking and our text banking. And it, our training uh, will be led by our outreach associate, Alan Schulman. Um, and for those of you who have already done this before and just want to get immediately to work, we're going to put the links in the chat. So over to you, Alan, and thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, if you were here just for the entertainment, stick around. Try try the phone banking and text banking with us. Uh, it's, it's actually quite entertaining as well. Uh, you might enjoy it. Okay, over to you, Alan.